Folks, let's get started. I want to give all the time that we need <clears throat> to our speakers and our program. Very unusual program today. Yeah. See if this um, sounds familiar. So between Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's Day, you put on about six pounds. January 2nd, you join a health club. You go on an unhealthy crash diet. February 1st, you quit the health club because now you've got a stress fracture. <laughs> and then after February 1st, you gain all that weight back plus a couple more pounds. So you've got a net gain of weight of two or three pounds right off the bat the first of the year with all your intentions was to get in shape, lose that weight, get rid of that belly fat. And we do everything wrong trying to reach that goal. Well, I can tell you that help is on the way. Help has arrived. We've got some speakers today who are going to help us in that journey of getting rid of that belly fat, uh, disregarding harmful, unhealthy fad diets. That's what we're going to learn today. So it's a pleasure to introduce our speakers who are going to tell us about themselves. Okay. Hi there. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? You. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm Susanna Bazzoni, and this is Chrissy Smith. And I'm a physician. I'm a family practice physician, family medicine physician, and I'm also a certified diplomate in lifestyle medicine. So if you haven't heard of lifestyle medicine, I encourage you to look it up. It's fantastic, and it is the evidence-based. It and it's here, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. <laughs> Uh, but it is evidence-based use of lifestyle. What does the data say about diet, about stress, about exercise, about um, community, about how to quit smoking, behavior change, and about sleep in order to prevent, uh, treat, and even reverse disease? So it's an inspirational uh, field that is really addressing the root causes of what's causing this chronic disease crisis that we face. And so Chrissy, if you want to talk about so I met Susanna Bazzoni as a health coach in the Erlanger system. And my goal as a health coach is not to tell you what to do, but to guide you in the healthy habits that you want to make and that the doctor is encouraging you to make and how that, that's going to fit into your lifestyle. Because what you do may not fit into my lifestyle and what you want to do may be different than what we want you to do. So we start where you are and we give you those tools and those action plans to work towards where you want to be. That's what a health coach does. I also spend a lot of time doing cooking demos and teaching people how to eat a whole food plant-based diet, which evidence has shown to be beneficial for all diseases. So there's not one right diet for diabetes or heart disease or obesity or inflammation. It's all the same diet. And so people need help because those fast food chains are just too easy to whip into. So I'm going to show you fast food, healthy fast food today. All right. So today we're going to talk about food as medicine, what the evidence suggests about the most common diet trends. But before we start, if we could all just kind of get centered in this space, because I know you guys have been coming from all kinds of different spaces right now. And um, you can do this from your chair. I know you're eating. Uh, but if you could put your food down for just a minute and close your eyes and take a deep breath in through your nose to a count of four. Hold it at the top for a count of four. And then exhale out your mouth to a count of six. Let's do that again two more times. Inhale to a count of four. Hold it to a count of four. And then exhale to a count of six. Out your mouth. One more time. If you want to, feel free to stretch your arms up. I love to do that. Don't knock your food over. Bring your arms up tall, maybe lean over to one side, stretching over your side body. 
I know you weren't expecting this. And then take it to the other side. Switch your arms. Oh, yeah. And get a nice opening. <laughs> Any dancing is welcome. Absolutely. And exhale that down. Couple shoulder shrugs and get centered in this space. Because anytime you come into a room with a patient or do whatever it is you do, if we're present in that moment, it's going to go a lot better and we're going to be thinking a lot clearer and bringing oxygen to our brain, which is what we want to do with our food as well. So as we get into this, you know, the framework of fad diets go anywhere from only meat all the time to only cookies all the time. And I'm not going to bother talking about the carnivore diet or the cookie diet, but we're going to talk about these four predominant, most common ones that we see in the middle keto, paleo, whole food, plant-based, and vegan, and dive into them. Because what we really want to know is where's the truth. Because this tug of war between, oh my God, is it low fat? Is it low sugar? Is it, who's the demon here? And what's the problem? And kind of makes everyone throw up their hands and just not care, right? And this is not serving anyone in terms of using food as medicine, which we know is truly something powerful that we can do. Uh, and it's important to realize that, you know, it's been said your beliefs affects your choices, your choices shape your actions. And I always want to know who's presenting the data and what are they trying, what point are they trying to get across, right? So I want you to know that I am not a paleontologist. I'm not a religious zealot. I'm not an ethicist and I'm not a politician. What I am is a physician, a mother, a wife, a daughter, an avid exerciser, and a community leader. So what I want to know when I'm looking through this data and I'm looking through the information is how to find the optimal diet for longevity and optimal health. Because the foods you eat can be either the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. So our goal today is to define and discuss the misconceptions and the health outcomes of the most popular diet trends today, those four that I mentioned. So let's start with just defining what is a keto diet. And now realize that there's a lot of different ways to be in ketosis. You know, uh, ketosis is when we shift from our primary fuel source of glucose to ketones as our primary fuel source. And there's two settings where this can occur. Starvation is one, but it's not a very popular diet trend. Right? The other is a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, which unfortunately is a very common diet trend. And what we see when you break down the plate of a keto or a typical keto diet, though you can get into keto from different means, but this is what's most commonly done out there, is 75% fat, 20% protein, and 5% carbohydrate. So just realize what is 5% carbohydrate. That's getting to maybe 10 to 20 grams of carbohydrate, which could get you two-thirds of an apple in, the, in your day as your total carbohydrate intake um, in, in, in the way this is often done. So a typical keto diet, when you look at the food pyramid, what does it consist of? The very foundation is very heavy in meat, poultry, and fish eggs and dairy. And when I say dairy, it's saturated full fat dairy. So no milk, no, no low uh, fat dairy, but it's the full fat cheese and, and cream, um, a lot of fats and oils, some green vegetables and non-green vegetables, um, and then a very little bit of nuts and seeds and berries. But what's kind of important here is what's excluded, because we exclude grains, uh, pasta, bread, sugar, refined grains, um, milk, we also exclude beans or legumes, and so that's really important. So what is paleo? Paleo is a least, uh, or the least extreme form of a low carbohydrate diet. So the premise of a paleo diet is that basically, okay, so we were doing okay until we started farming. And that just kind of threw us all, all out the window, right? So it must be the problem of why we're so fat in this country must be that it's the grains and the legumes, and that's what led to our obesity crisis. So if we get rid of that, then we'll be eating like we were in the paleo hunter-gatherer time, and then we'll be healthier. But there's a lot of problems with this situation. It, it also, and the truth is that um, the current paleo is nothing like the paleo was back then. But again, I'm not a paleontologist, so I'm not going to go into that. But it's important to realize that what is claimed as paleo today is not at all similar to, to what was thought to be eaten back in the paleo era. But when you look at the foundation, again, what you find is that it's very centered and foundationally meets 
eggs, um, very high saturated fat foods. Then you get some more vegetables and fruits and um, more nuts and berries allowed because you have um, more of an allotment of carbohydrates allowed. Again, you have no dairy. You get rid of those nasty processed foods, refined grains. Uh, and again, you have no beans allowed in this. So when the you look at the plate, you've got less fat, so 50% fat, still a lot of fat, but 50% rather than 75 30% protein and 20% carbohydrate. So when we look at the, and by the way, these slides, many of these slides are from Brenda Davis. And if you don't know who Brenda Davis, she's a registered dietitian. I really encourage looking her up. She's amazing. And she really expresses this stuff incredibly, much better than I ever could. So um, if you look at how paleo and keto are the same and how they're different, this shows you in the blue how they're similar. So they're very high in meat, uh, poultry, fish, and eggs. They're, they both include nuts and seeds which we do know are beneficial for health. Green vegetables are included, beans are excluded, grains are excluded. So those are all the same in both of these diets. But as you get to where they're different, you see that paleo excludes dairy as opposed to keto. Uh, you get more non-starchy vegetables allowed. You actually get starchy vegetables, some of them in a limited fashion as opposed to in the keto where you are not allowed keto, um, starchy vegetables. What is that noise? I was just curious. Uh, anyway, um, okay, so, so starchy vegetables are allowed but excluded in keto. Um, you get more fruits allowed in paleo, and um, your fats and oils are moderate as opposed to very high uh, as they are in keto. So what are the benefits versus the risks of your typical keto or low-carbohydrate, high-fat diets? So realize in background that the only data supporting chronic ketosis is in the realm of refractory epilepsy. And there is data on that. So strong data to show that kids that cannot get their seizures controlled uh, through the typical medications will do better on a chronic ketosis, um, in a chronic ketosis state. However, we see very clear associative harms with high saturated fat, high protein, animal protein diets. So we see that um, associated increased total cholesterol, increased cancer rates, heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, body mass index, and all-cause mortality. So a very well-known cardiologist, Joel Kahn, calls this the low-carb, high-coffin diet as a, a result of these unfortunate trends that we see. And to break this down a little bit further, uh, in this meta-analysis, we see on the, the y-axis the hazard ratio representing mortality, and on the x-axis energy from carbohydrate. And what you see here is that the lowest carbohydrate, which would be here on the left, has the highest relative mortality. Then you get down and you get to the lowest relative mortality around 50 to 60 percent which probably not coincidentally is where we find most of the blue zones. Have you guys heard of the blue zones? So blue zones, um, most longest living populations, there's five of them in the world. They've been studied extensively as to how they live, what they eat, those kind of things. And where they typically fall, 50 to 60 or maybe even more percent carbohydrate. So this kind of, this study actually falls quite in line with that. And then you see a small increase in mortality the further up you go from there, but not as high as you would in the lower carb, uh, the lowest carb diets. And in fact, uh, in this 25 year follow up, we see f over 15,000 patients, the lowest carbohydrate eaters, which they, which, which they had um, in the setting of less than 40%, which is actually relative to, to what we're talking about, not that low carb, but the lowest carbohydrate eater, 40% um, and below, had a 32% increase in all-cause mortality. It's pretty big. 51% increase in heart disease. So why do we need to go on a diet to increase our chance of getting our number one killer? a 35% increase in cancer rates. And to put it back into perspective, recall that keto is less than 5% carbohydrate and paleo is 20% carbohydrate or less. So, so this is pretty significant and pretty important that we're aware of this trend. Um, to take it a step further and looking specifically at heart disease, our number one killer, this study from Harvard, um, looking at heart attack survivors, so, so people that already had a heart attack, who were eating a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. And what they showed is that those people eating that diet trend had a 33% higher increase in all cause premature death. A 51% increase in cardiovascular disease compared to those that were not eating this diet trend. 
And conversely, if we look at this, this article published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, 30,000 postmenopausal women who substituted vegetable-based protein for animal-based protein had a 30% lower premature cardiovascular death. So we see these trends again and again and again um, in, in terms of, of our health, but specifically for our heart disease, the European Society of Cardiology in 2018 made this statement, low carbohydrate diets are unsafe and should be avoided. So as we're constantly hearing this low carb, low carb, low carb, it's really important that we're all aware of what the true uh, re recommendations and the scientific consensus is around uh, this type of diet. And in fact, the only diet proven to reverse heart disease, this is not a real picture, I just want you to know, <laughs> just an animation, uh, but it is a whole food plant-based diet. So if this was going to be real, then it would say whole food plant-based diet, not vegan, and we'll talk about why that is. But, you know, the, the current uh, president of the American College of Cardiology, um, Ken Williams, says that there are two types of cardiologists those that eat a, referring to a whole food plant-based uh, vegan diet, and those that haven't read the data. So th really important stuff here. So when we look at heart disease, um, let's talk about who are the main pioneers in the realm of diet and heart disease. And we look at Dean Ornish. And if you guys are familiar with Dean Ornish's work, if you're not, I really encourage you to look at it. He wrote this among many other books, Reversing Heart Disease. But his program involves four things. So it's a whole food plant-based diet, but it also has three other very important components. So three and a half hours of exercise, stress management and meditation uh, in the realm of, of yoga, and group, um, uh, group meetings or connection. And so with those four things, he's had pretty amazing results that are now covered by Medicare and many other insurance plans because of their ability to reverse heart disease. And, and so um, a randomized controlled trial, what he has, sh has shown and continues to show is a significant 91% reduction in angina. And I think that's almost more important than, than the actual truth, which is that we're seeing improvement in blood flow and actually improved imaging in terms of reversing heart disease. But the fact that these guys don't have angina anymore, they can invest in their life, they can play with their grandkids, they can be invested and involved in their life, which is the most valuable thing. That's why we're here, right? Um, and what he continues to show is that more reversal of the atherosclerosis after five years than after one year, which is fantastic. So the more you do it, the better you go and the continued healing you get. Um, and compared to his control group, they had, and these control groups were taking medications as prescribed by, as a typical population prescribed by their cardiologist and, and following the advice of their cardiologist, as people do, whatever that means, right? But um, continue to progress in the control group more than twice as many cardiac events. But you say, well, how much of that was a diet, right? Because they were exercising, they were med meditating, they had this group support, they had love and connection. That's all really important stuff. But then you see um, Caldwell Esselstyn's work, where the only intervention that he had was a very strict uh, whole food plant-based diet. And he showed also very similar results in that he had 93% improved angina. Um, and what's important here is that so often, I think we have this impression that, oh, that's so, se that's so severe and dramatic, no one's going to do it, right? But in fact, 89% adherence because what you gain is so much better than what you give up. And if you look at the adherence rate of this diet, which is incredibly strict, particularly in Esselstyn's version of it, is 89% um, adherent. And when you look at the adherence rate of statin medications, it's only 50 to 75% adherence. So it's actually better with a diet than with a medication, uh, with our most commonly used medication, which is effective, right? Um, so so when, when you look at the people that were not adherent in his group, they had a 62% recurrent event rate compared to 0.6% recurrent events in those that followed his diet as the only intervention. But I thought that low carb is the way to lose weight. How many people, you think? You think how many times have you heard that? Well, that's baloney. Because keto, let's talk about keto and weight loss. Um, a high protein diet average weight loss is 20 pounds in six months. And this is not significantly different from other regimens or other weight loss regimens that we see. Keto weight loss may be more rapid, but it's not sustained. And this has been showed in a meta shown in a metabolic ward trial, which is the most rigid, you know, everything is, is monitored um, uh, in, a, in a metabolic ward, so, so no room for variation in that trial. 
and that what we've seen is that the amount of carbohydrates has no effect on the degree of weight loss. Um, this is found in a review of 107 carb-restricted diet studies. So I think maybe the better um, diet for sustained weight loss might be amputation. Oh, you've put on a little weight since our last, give me a minute. <laughs> not funny. It's not funny. I'm not getting any laughs up here. Come on, guys. <laughs> but wait, I know that grains are bad because when we talk about carbohydrates, so often we're, uh, we're making these the same as grains, right? But we have to realize that carbohydrates involve a lot of things. So we have to really be clear about what we're talking about because if we're not clear about it, then our patients won't be clear about it. So let's talk about grains and realize that we can't throw out the baby with the bath water. So what's, uh, and, and that all whole grains or all whole grains, when they say whole grains, are not created equal. A granola bar is not the same as a bowl of oatmeal, and even organic Kemut flakes are not the same as a Kemut berry salad. And why is that? Because the quality of the grains do matter, and we, when we look at the processing of a grain, you see wheat over here on the left, and then if it's converted into white flour on the right. And what do we do in this process? First thing we do is take away the bran. And what's in the bran is fiber. Right? Fiber is super important. So we take out the, the fiber, and then we take out the germ, which is the nutrient-dense core. Right? So we've basically taken out all the nutrients, and then we're left with this endosperm, which is the middle layer, and it's a filler. And what's it do? It sits on the shelf, so it never rots, which is really great if you're trying to sell a product, but it also sits on our, mid our midsections and never goes away. So what we see as typical losses in this process of refining grains is we lose 80 to 90% of the fiber, 70 to 80 percent of the vitamins and minerals, and 95 percent of the phytochemicals that are so healing in this diet. So what we want to do is keep it whole, keep our nutrient density, and most of all, maintain that fiber, not from Metamucil, but from its whole source. So eating whole grains such as uh, black and brown rice, oats, oat groats, millet, rye, quinoa, buckwheat, wild rice, and in the words of the Lady Baroness Crawley, how unrefined. Hmm. You guys are a tough crowd. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the whole grain hierarchy. Again, this is a wonderful, there's a whole YouTube video Brenda Davis does and explains this incredibly well on YouTube. Whole grain hierarchy, search Brenda Davis and you will find her 12 minute video explaining this really well. But what we want to do when we're eating grains is we want to maintain the most nutrient dense forms of our grains. So those are intact whole grains and better yet sprouted whole grains. We're talking about barley, oat groats, quinoa. Then every time we process something, we cut it, we roll it, we shred it, we ground it, um, all of these things are creating increased surface area of our grains and unfortunately doing us a disservice in the glycemic load. So, so cut whole grains such as steel cut oats and bulgur, then rolled whole grains, rolled oats, barley. Um, now, if you're trying to lose weight or you have an insulin resistant condition or, or, a, or a patient with such, then you really want to stay kind of above this, this shredded or above line in terms of shredded whole grain like shredded wheat. Um, if you're trying to lose weight, again, PCOS, Alzheimer's, um, diabetes, all of these insulin, very insulin driven um, uh, conditions. Uh, and we want to really avoid gr um, really the shredding, the grinding into flour. Uh, flaking it into cold flake cereals and for sure puffing it. So how many people think that rice cakes are a, a, a health food? Not at all, right? These are the worst on the glycemic load, right? Because the surface area uh, is just, is just, it just shoots your insulin way up there and all the fiber has been depleted from it. So I thought that for it, forever, because we're not taught this in medical school, I know. Um, so, so, but puffing it's the worst. So that's Cheerios. That's our puffed, how many, how many parents, really well-intended parents served puff vegetable straws, organic vegetable, right? completely worthless, <laughs> right? I mean, they could be worse, let's face that. But, but the thing is, is that we're, we're very misled in this, in this, so I really encourage you to, to watch that video. But certainly carbohydrates are bad for diabetics, right? How many patients do I see that their doctors are telling them to restrict their carbohydrates? Mm. Well, so we do find short-term sugar control with keto dieting and with low-carbohydrate dieting. But there's, realize in the keto state, there's no long-term studies on that whatsoever. Um, and the bottom line is that keto does not address the root cause of diabetes, which is insulin resistance. So, so what we're doing is worsening the carbohydrate intolerance. And we'll talk about why that is. But if you reduce your glucose by reducing your carbohydrates, you will see better sugar. 
But if we don't talk about what's driving that problem, why is the sugar not going into the cell, what's in the cell, and what's going on in that process, then we're never going to get to the root cause, and we're going to continue throwing medications as it, at it. And I'm sure you've seen that despite all the money that goes into diabetes, we have not seen any improved control in our diabetics. And they have more than double the, the health care expenditures from a non-diabetic patient. So this is really important. And when you look at the EPIC study, which is a mass of 16,000 plus people, what we see is that for every 5% increase in animal protein intake, there's a 30% increase in diabetes risk. That's pretty amazing. And I know these are association studies, but it's really important to this as a framework. And then we see this followed up with randomized controlled trials. And, and the data is very clear on this. So I'm on that diet where you cut out all the carbs and all the sugar and all the happiness. <laughs> yes, but so what do we want to do to get to the root cause? And what is the root cause of insulin resistance? So what we need to do with the diet using our food as medicine is put a lid on the drivers of those things. Li lipotoxicity is the one I'm going to talk about today because unfortunately we don't have a lot of time to talk about these others, but these others really play a role. It's not just one thing, it's a synergy of a lot of things. Um, dysbiosis, so the role of the healthy and varied gut microbiome is massive in our health and we see this more and more and more coming out in the studies. And how do we get a good microbiome? Probiotics, right? No, 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 it's by feeding fiber, feed your friends. And so we've got to create that diversity through a healthy, varied plant-based diet that we'll talk about. Um, inflammation is a really key driver and oxidative stress. So um, we also, of course, want to see weight loss in our overweight participants and we're trying to reverse diabetes, but also realize that in the studies, even if you lose weight, but you maintain a very animal dominant diet, you are still more insulin resistant than your plant-based counterparts. Same weight, you know, body mass uh, index controlled, et cetera. Uh, we also want to restore nutritional health. So how do we do that? And, and wait just a second, fat causes diabetes, not sugar? <sighs> like what? Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, I got one lab there. Okay, so let's just talk about lipotoxicity and what is that? Um, the accumulation of lipids in non adipose tissue, such as this is visceral fat we're talking about, and particularly vital organs in the liver, fatty liver, heart, pancreas. And what happens with lipotoxicity is this cascade that produces cell damage and cell death. Tissue inflammation, again, inflammation, the underlying driver of chronic disease. Mitochondrial dysfunction, insulin resistance, ding, 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 elevated triglycerides, and elevated blood glucose. So um, what are the types of fats that we're talking about that drive this insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity? Realize that it's saturated fat and trans fats that have detrimental effect on insulin sensitivity. However, polyunsaturated fats which we find from plants, improve insulin sensitivity. So it's not, what I'm saying is not to get rid of all fat. Fat is really important, but it's the sources make all the difference. And where do we get the most overwhelming intake of our saturated fat? It's through animal products, right? So animal products and processed foods. So when we eliminate that, we see amazing things happen. So let's talk about low carb and diabetes. So going back to that, you will see short-term improved sugar on a keto diet or on a very low carbohydrate diet because you're reducing the sugar, right? So, so sugar is still not going in the cell, but there's just less of it. So, you're, so your control gets better, but you're covering the symptom and you're not getting to the root cause of what's driving the resistant process. So in order to do this, we've got to address the intramyocellular fat, the saturated fat that gets within the cell that drives that lipotoxicity and inflammatory cascade that is contributing to the root cause of this problem. So what diet will reduce our risk of diabetes? Well, a whole food plant-based diet is actually effectively puts a lid on all of these drivers of insulin resistance. Uh, we talked about lipotoxicity, but again, dysbiosis, feeding your friends, that fiber is so important. Reducing oxidative stress, and where do we get uh, antioxidants most consistently from a varied whole food plant-based diet from our plants. And they also reduce inflammation. And I didn't put all this in here about, for the sake of time, but what we see is that people that eat this way have lower underlying CRP levels, right? Their inflammatory levels are lower than those that eat um, a animal-based diet. 
So research shows us that plant-based diets are cost-effective, low-risk interventions that are associated with lower body mass index, blood, lower blood pressure, lower sugar, lower cholesterol. They help you reduce medications. They're only diet proven to reverse heart disease, lower cancer rates, and lower mortality. Wow, one diet will treat them all because these same processes that are driving the inflammation, all of those things, are actually the same processes that drive all of our chronic diseases, which is so amazing, right? It's our genetics that will say, I'm diabetic, I have cancer, I have heart disease, but the underlying process is the same. So having one diet that's a low carb diet because you're, car you're diabetic, but then having another diet because you have heart disease doesn't make any sense. So the great thing about this is that one diet applies to all of this and it's really uh, empowering when you see it. So what does it look like, a whole food plant-based diet? We see that the foundation, as opposed to a meat-heavy uh, diet, as we've seen previously, is vegetables. They don't have to be raw. You can have raw cooked vegetables, but vegetables, and especially those dark greens, but all the colors in there. Fruits, beans, beans are really key. <laughs> Seeds and nuts uh, in moderation, whole grains, and then trying to eliminate, uh, or re significantly reduce or eliminate eggs, fish, dairy, and certainly processed foods, red meat, um, processed meats, etc. So uh, looking at the blue zone average intakes, what we see, now this is not necessarily um, the same as a whole food plant-based diet that we're using to reverse heart disease, or, which could be a little bit more strict, but the blue zone average intake, we have 62% carbohydrates. It's just what kind of carbohydrates are they? If you look at the longest living female population in the world, Okinawa, Japan, they're eating about 60% carbohydrate, but, but it's predominantly sweet potato, right? They're not eating rice cakes. Um, and so 12% so protein and 25% fat. And that amount of fat may be different depending on what your, your uh, goal is in your uh, treatment plan. So what exactly is it? If you just remember one thing that's great to tell your patients, this, this statement by Michael Pollan, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. So if you just take one thing, take that. But more definitively, uh, defined, a whole food plant-based diet is defined as a diet that's centered on whole, unrefined, or minimally refined plants. It's based on fruits, vegetables, tubers, whole grains, and legumes, or beans, and excludes or minimizes meat, including chicken and fish, excludes dairy, uh, eggs, as well as highly refined foods like bleached flour, refined flour, uh, refined sugar, and oil. So I like to say, eat the colors of the rainbow on a bed of greens with a side of beans. And if you do this, even if you just do this for one lunch a day or one meal a day, you will be healthier. So make it beautiful. And this really drives, you know why they sell Skittles? Why they sell M&Ms? It's because we are meant to eat these beautiful colors. So make sure, and if you have kids or you know, get your, your rainbow chart and start checking off what colors you've eaten today, because it really makes a big difference. And just a special word on the beauty of beans. Because this is also something, there is uh, a lot of that, but the anti-nutrients and all of the, this, I don't know if you're familiar with who I'm talking about, but it's completely bogus. The information that beans are bad for you is completely bogus. So, so just get that straight. You do have to, to cook them. That's really important. But aside from that, they're thought to be the most important dietary predictor of survival and longevity worldwide. So this, this uh, article cited below, uh, it, this is consistently when we look at probably what's the number one driver of all the longest living populations in the world, what's the most consistent thing? They all eat beans. Beans and a lot of them. Um, for every, it's a, there's associated 8% reduction in death for every two tablespoon increase of bean intake a day. And so this should really be your primary protein source. So there's so much press about protein, 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 but where do you get your protein? Where do you get your protein? Right? If you ever go plant based, if you ever have a patient that's vegan, I'm just not, con I'm concerned you're not going to get your protein. But as long as you get your beans, and you have to be able to eat beans in order to do this, uh, this diet really properly to get your amino acid needs met. But they're so key, they're nice and cheap, uh, and they're also the highest dietary source of fiber. So going back to, I would love to just give you a whole talk on fiber, but I'll save you that. Uh, and realize though that when we go back to that dysbiosis, you know, how do we feed our friends? How do we feed our microbiome? It's through fiber, not through Metamucil. And we've got to get the fiber from the highest source of fiber is from beans and then from all these vegetables in their non-processed form and grains included. So just eat vegan, right? So if we're vegan, we're healthy. Is that true? 
No, not at all, right? Because what's the difference between vegan and whole food plant-based? And this is why this is really key. So when people say, I'm eating vegan, so it's good, this is not necessarily good. You can be completely nutrient deficient and very unhealthy as a vegan. Um, so it's important that we just, uh, make the discrepancy here. A vegan means I am not intaking any animal products. So I'm, I'm concerned for animal welfare or ethical decisions or, or, or the earth, and all of those are very important things, but they're not gonna drive health per se. So you could be a vegan and eat the Impossible Burger with fries and Oreos every single day, and you wouldn't be really healthy, right? But what's important is, again, the quality of the food, the quality of the carbohydrates and all of the food that we eat makes a huge difference. And so we wanna get the best of both worlds. It's wonderful to not kill animals and it's wonderful to save your carbon footprint and all that, but that's not what we're here to talk about today, though that's an added bonus. And what we see is this wonderful article. If you wanna um, read the Satija, Journal American Car College uh, of Cardiology, 2017. Um, it, what she showed, was she, she made a discrepancy between a healthy plant food diet and an unhealthy plant-based diet. And it makes a big difference because we see healthy uh, plant-based foods and that diet has a substantially lower heart disease and diabetes risk, but unhealthy vegan food poses an increased risk um, of heart disease and type 2 diabetes. So the quality of the food absolutely matters. And if you're just looking for practical tips, just start with increasing something because it's a lot harder to decrease something or to tell your patients, just stop eating you know, fish, chicken, dairy, you know, that, that doesn't work very well. But just say, hey, if you can start increasing your whole vegetable and fruit servings and try to get to ideally 10 servings per day, um, that's gonna get you very far. You don't wanna go from zero to one serving a day to 10 servings a day, cause you'll have a lot of um, bloating <laughs> and some other issues, but you wanna gradually increase with a goal of more than seven, ideally 10 servings a day. So why does it work? Well, important to realize that less bad is not good enough. So when we look at the DASH diet, which was inherently initially supposed to be a plant-based diet, but then they kept on watering it down so that people would do it, well, you're not gonna reverse disease if you do a watered down version of the truth. So less bad is not good enough. If you really wanna make significant changes, you have to make significant changes. If you really want to improve your health, you gotta make a pretty stark turnaround. But what we get is a double whammy because not only are we taking out the disease-causing food, we're replacing it with disease-fighting food. So that's why it works so well. And what are the dietary disease causers from highly processed and highly animal driven foods? Trans fatty acids, excessive saturated fats, where we get most of our saturated fat, refined carbohydrates in processed foods, excessive sodium, chemical contaminants from processed foods and stuff that goes in there, products of high cooking temps, um, um, uh, po uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, hydrocyclic amines, these kind of things that spin off when we barbecue or cook meat at high temperatures, pro-oxidants. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of new 5GC. It's, 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 it is, it's associated with, um, it's found in tumors and it's not in humans. And so the only source where this can be attained is from non-human mammals, right? So there's a, there's just got an interesting place of research where we're kind of seeing why is it that we see these increased cancer rates with higher uh, animal product driven diet. So this is just one of the theories of, over there. Um, TMAO, if you're familiar with TMAO, um, that increases cardiovascular disease risk. Um, this main sources of the precursor to this are eggs and red meat. And the underlying thing is there's a lot of stuff to talk about here, but just to realize that um, most of these drivers are coming from the standard American diet and a highly animal-driven, processed food-driven diet. And finally, endotoxins, um, which we see from gram-negative bacteria. Uh, and we see higher levels of endotoxins with, um, with animal uh, product eaters as opposed to um, more healthy uh, plant-based dieters. And so what are the disease fighters that we're intaking? Fiber, uh, phytochemicals, plant enzymes, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory compounds, plant sterols and stanols, prebiotics and probiotics. Uh, if you look at prebiotics, as we're talking about um, uh, what are the foods that really feed the good microbiome. Probiotics are in uh, something we can take, but also in fermented foods and plant foods, uh, macro and micronutrients. So the question is not exactly what is the diet to, to uh, recommend to yourself or to your patients, but perhaps more where to start. Because so often we will say, do this, do this, do this, do this. But if we don't connect with the why, why do you want to live longer? 
And that's the underlying question. If we want to make significant behavior change in ourselves or in others, we have to connect and give a purpose to what we're doing. We can't just go on a diet, right? Because those don't work, just as you expressed in, in, in the intro, right? So, so this is not a diet. This is a lifestyle. So we have to connect it with our intention. Um, Dostoevsky said, the mystery of human existence lies not in just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. And if we want to make a massive impact in, our, in ourselves, in our patients, in our community, and in this country's um, health crisis that we've got to start connecting to our purpose and realize why we want to live longer and how significant the diet can be so connecting to what matters most and not getting overwhelmed by this huge change of diet but realize that it's not about what you're giving up but it's about what you're gaining so starting with those little steps increasing vegetables increasing beans and going from there and connecting to why you're doing it and what matters most to you so in summary, avoid high fat, high protein diets. Eat more vegetables and fruit in their whole form, not in their puffed form. Avoid processed foods. Don't fear the carbohydrate, but choose your carbohydrates carefully. And shift to a whole food plant-based diet for optimal health. And most importantly, know why you're here. So thank you so much. I've got uh, a bunch of citations here if you want more information. And this is, um, if you want to contact me or have any questions, this is our information at True Health Journey, which is a lifestyle-based clinic that um, in the South Side in Chattanooga. So thank you very much. Okay, I got 15 minutes to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, I can do this. All right, the first thing we're going to do is really show you how easy it would be to get up in the morning and fix breakfast, lunch, and dinner for tonight. The first thing we're going to do, and probably I would do this on the weekend, is to do oatmeal in a jar. And some of you probably have already done this, so I'm going to fill up my jar whoop, and the floor with half a cup or so, as you can see it's not exact, of oatmeal. And this is rolled oats. You don't want to do this with steel cut because it probably wouldn't work very well. Okay, so there's my rolled oats in there. Now I'm going to do three different kinds. I'm going to do a banana blueberry. And here's my banana. So I'm just going to cut this banana in here. And you could, whoops. Um, <laughs> these bananas do not want to go in that jar. Okay, so I've got my banana in there. I've got frozen blueberries. Frozen blueberries tend to want to give up their syrup a little easier than the fresh kind. And then I'm just going to fill it up. This is almond milk, unsweetened almond milk. Now, when you're transitioning away from sugar uh, and sweet taste, you may want to add a little maple syrup, a little honey or something. But um, once you get away from that, the fruit in here is definitely a, as sweet as it can be. All right, my next one is going to be a carrot. Those are shredded carrots, some raisins, and a little bit of cinnamon. Okay, so that's my second breakfast. So if I'm busy in the morning, I can just grab one of these jars and run out the door. And I can eat it cold or I could warm it up a little bit. Now my last one could either have dark cherries in it or I like just plain raspberries. And then you can always add walnuts, ground flax seed, chia seed, hemp seed, whatever kind of seed of the day it is. And that one's going to be there. Okay. So I've got breakfast done. I can put these in the refrigerator and I have eaten them up to two weeks after. All right, there we go. Now, on to lunch. So you ate the easy bean salad. So all these recipes are available at our website, but everybody has to have an easy salad that they can pull out and take to a potluck or just have in the fridge for the week. This is frozen corn. I thawed it out. It really was hard. And then I thawed out some lima beans. My husband loves lima beans. You could use so, uh, edamame. And then we've got a combination of kidney beans 
black eyed peas and pinto beans and these all come straight from the can rinsed off. All right, now I'm going to show you my favorite thing. So I want some color in here. I've already got yellow and green and brown, but I'm going to put some red pepper in here. And this is my favorite thing. I would like to show people that you do not have to stand and chop. All you have to do is get a crepe chop. And there you got it. So my red pepper is... Okay, we're going to do a little bit of red, a purple onion. So look, Susanna and I talk about eating the rainbow all the time. And this salad certainly is the rainbow. Everybody needs one of these for Christmas. It's called a crank chop. Okay. How, how much on Amazon? Got it. Of course. I have a lot of people that are in the audience and they're already ordering it. Okay, so I'm just going to use a fat-free Italian dressing. And you can make your own, but if you keep this in the cabinet, you'll always have it ready to go. All right. So my bean salad is done. All right. So look at the beautiful colors and remember her talking about beans and the benefits of beans and the uh, prebiotics, very important. All right, so lunchtime I can take some bean salad, I can put it in a wrap, I can put it in a salad with some tomatoes and cucumbers and all kinds of things, but maybe I want a wrap, and that's what you all ate today, and I know it's not rocket science, but just some pre-made hummus. But the key here is to get a really healthy wrap. And my rule of thumb in my classes, I tell people to take the carbohydrates on the wrapper and divide it by the grams of fiber. So this, the carbs are 13, the fiber is 6. And when you divide it, if you get 5 or less, it's a good grain product. So 13 divided by 6, that's pretty much less than 5. So that's a good wrap. All right, and I'm going to remember my rainbow again. I'm going to put some yellow peppers in here. I'm going to put some cucumber. I feel like I'm on one of those shows where you have to <laughs> hurry, hurry, hurry so you can win the prize. And then I've got some spinach and some shredded carrots and some purple cabbage. So lots of color, lots of healthy protein, lots of antioxidants, and we're just going to roll that up, and that's going to be our lunch. Okay? All right, we are moving on to dinner. And I just couldn't decide what to do for dinner, so I'm going to do three dinners. And all of these are on our website, but these are all one-pot dinners. So the first one we're going to do in this pot is going to be a red lentil uh, pasta sauce over zoodles. So I am amazed now that they sell zucchini noodles in the grocery store. I've seen them in the freezer section, but they're so easy to make. You can get this on Amazon, too, but I also have a, a spiralizer that I use. But if it's just you at home and you want some zucchini noodles, you put your zucchini in there and turn it, and out come the noodles. Doesn't take very long, but if you've got a big family, you might want to get a spiralizer. Okay. All right, so for our one-pot lentil marinara. If you guys can't see, feel free to come down there. Yeah. You know, sitting is the new cigarette. Yeah. Okay, so for our marinara, I'm going to use an Engine 2. Uh, it is a sodium-free marinara sauce. Put that in there. 
I'm going to put my lentils. These are red lentils, and red lentils are really good because they soak up the sauce and they make it kind of meaty. You, you know what I'm talking about. All right, you've got a half a cup of red lentils. I'm going to put a bay leaf in here that I'm going to hopefully remember to take out before I serve it. And then I've got, uh, I have some garlic here somewhere. Okay, I've got a piece of garlic that I'm just going to put in there whole and probably take that out as well. Okay, so um, I've got all of that in there and I'm also going to add a little bit of veggie broth for the lentils. And if I turn this up, on the on the on the stove or I could do this in an instant pot which is right here or some kind of slow cooker but the lentils will cook up and soak up that marinara sauce and get nice and thick and that will take about 20 minutes lentils don't take very long at all they are a small bean and so they're super healthy super high in protein and fiber and I could serve that over my zucchini noodles and I could use them cold or I could warm them up if I want to but cold is kind of a, a nice way because the sauce warms it up or I could use a whole wheat noodle this is a hundred percent organic uh, whole wheat uh, pasta but there's so many great pastas out there now this is a chickpea pasta one serving has about 25 grams of protein and about 13 grams of fiber so you can really get some amazing pastas now and if you think about it pastas are really good because they soak up a lot of water and so they're really half water and their glycemic index is pretty low okay we're going to move on to our next dish and this one I'm going to put in my instant pot in fact we had this last night for dinner and this is a rice and beans dish and I'm going to put a cup of brown rice in here and I'm going to put a can of black beans. You could use any kind of beans you like if you like pinto beans better but the black beans are super healthy because of that dark black color and I'm going to put some diced tomatoes and two cups of veggie broth and some cilantro make it kind of Mexican-y and then I've got I chopped these in my little crank chop and so this is celery red pepper um, and red onion so all of that's going in there. And then my spices are, let's see what my spices are. Cumin, let's see, cumin, um, chili powder, oregano, and then I suggest that you salt and pepper at the table. Leave the salt out of your cooking and then you decide because usually you will use far less if you use it at the table. Okay, so all I've got to do now is stir that up and if you have a pressure cooker all you have to do is turn it on pressure cook for 22 minutes and you're ready to go. Okay, at the end you'll probably want to put some more cilantro on top, maybe some lime juice. Uh, we had it last night with avocado and salsa. So, an easy, easy dinner. All right, I'm going to put that one over here. I've got one more. All right, this one is a cheesy broccoli rice casserole with chickpeas. So, we could also do this in the rice cooker, or we could do it on the stove top, or we could just bake it like it suggests in the oven. But all we're going to do is put two and a half, well I think I already measured this out, okay, two and a half um, cups of veggie broth and nutritional yeast. How many of you love nutritional yeast and that cheesy flavor? Yes. 
We've got about a half a cup of nutritional yeast. We are going to put a little turmeric in there, which you know is anti-inflammatory. Also going to make it a little yellowy. And then we've got uh, garlic. Got some chopped garlic here. Two cups of chickpeas. We're going to use chickpeas for this one. They have a little crunchier taste. And we could use rice, but instead we're going to use quinoa, which was another of her whole grains. And this is really high in protein as well and fiber as well. And I'm going to put about a half a cup in there. And then I'm going to add my broccoli, which you could also use frozen. And give it a stir. I think we've got everything in there. So as the quinoa cooks, the broccoli will, will cook, and the beans are already cooked. So there you go. So you have three options there. You've got your lentil marinara on zoodles. You've got your rice and beans, uh, Mexican rice and beans, or you've got your cheesy broccoli and uh, quinoa. So three dinners, all done for the day. I really want to encourage you all to make this doable for your patients. But first of all, you have to make sure that it is doable for you. So I teach classes on whole food plant-based cooking. It's not your normal cooking because everything that I do is calculated. Is this evidence-based science? Is this going to reverse disease? Is it going to prevent disease? It's different than if you were just teaching people how to cook. It's very important that you believe that this will work because people will do it. So don't believe that they won't. You know, get them to use a food journal uh, and then bring it back to them, to you, and ask, how did it go? What kind of changes are you making? Uh, at True Health Journey, we really take that person who really wants to make those changes and works with them side by side. And as they begin to be successful in little things, like Susanna said, maybe they just add that half a cup of beans in that week. Or maybe they start doing oatmeal in the morning. Those are successful changes that they can make very easily, but they really make them feel like they can do that. So I think we all as a medical community need to believe that this is as important, if not more important than medicine. And we need to give our patients the tools that they can use to make this something that they could do at home. This is where we need to go. And Susanna and I, and our lifestyle medicine practice, True Health Journey, hope that you will partner with us. I want you to look at your resource list, and I want to give you a challenge. The first resource there is Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. They have a 21-day kickstart. It's an all whole food plant-based vegan kickstart that is designed breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can get it on an app and you can take it with you to the grocery store. There are videos uh, all during the 21 days that teach you about why they're doing what they're doing. And it's very, very helpful and can be for your patients. And it's free. The other thing, let's say you just want to do seven days, okay? Then we've got that. In Engine 2 has a seven-day challenge. So if you go to engine2diet.com, seven-day challenge, and they also give you some amazing tips on how to make this sustainable. The resources are out there. We are here in Chattanooga, so let's make Chattanooga a plant-strong city. Thank you. Questions? That was awesome. Thank you. What? Oh, the easy bean salad. It's on the PCR website. You guys have any questions? The recipe, all of them are on our website. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Yeah.